In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, thank you so much for your word, which is really you, because you are the word of God. Um, it's amazing, Lord, how you know how to touch our hearts and how to give us what we need and how to address what we're dealing with in our life with the same word can accomplish so much with it for every single one of us uh, who has different situations and different needs and your word is infinite and unlimited to every perfection I have seen an end but your statutes are very broad help us Lord to appreciate you appreciate your word and to take it as <clears throat> you talking to us and addressing us and building the relationship with us. Be with us, O oh Lord, tonight and fill us with your word. Please hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us they our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank God for mute buttons. Okay. Uh, so last time, uh, we did chapter 7 from verse 5 to the end. Um Size-wise, we didn't cover a whole lot of material, but uh, it was a great discussion. I'll uh, just mention some of the highlights as usual, <clears throat> and I do invite you all to just jump in. Uh, if you recall, we we uh, contemplated like in verse six was about the where where Saint Paul says God is the one who comforts the downcast, um, and we recalled how like you know in the in the matins and. And in the in the liturgy, in the fractions, we see how the help of those who flee to him and the hope of those who cry out to him, the help of those who have no helper and the comfort of the faint-hearted, the harbor of those in the storm. <clears throat> and then we said something that is so obvious and yet a lot of us so frequently forget it. And it would be awesome if, if we do remember it, which is that God sees you and hears you and feels you and is fully aware of all your needs and, and, and the state of your heart, even more than you are aware of them. So remember this and rest in it. <clears throat> remember this and rest in it. And then we looked a little bit about these couple of verses where St. Paul is saying like, I, I I made you sorry. I regret making you sorry. And then it goes, but I didn't regret making you sorry. But I do regret making you sorry. <laughs> um, kind of like the parent who punishes their child and then cries with them. And then we said, uh, we talked a lot about repentance, actually, which, which I loved. It wasn't planned, but um, I, I felt like it was really necessary to kind of clarify or, or define better, like, what is repentance and the journey of repentance? And we said um, that anything that leads to repentance is good, even if it's painful, even if it's sorrowful. Uh, anything that leads to repentance is good. Um, just like in James 3, when we learned about godly wisdom and versus earthly wisdom, that we also saw that there's something called godly sorrow, which is good, and earthly sorrow, which is not good. We saw that earthly sorrow, how to differentiate earthly sorrow, can lead to complaining or depression or faint-heartedness or giving up or revenge or even to death. But godly sorrow can lead to waking up, opening our eyes, uh, can lead to us getting up from the mud, can lead to repentance and to a better life, and can lead to an eternal life. So 
just because something is painful or sorrowful or undesirable does not mean it's bad. It's easier said than done, I know, but it's something that would be very good to remember. Um, we're now in a culture that is, is allergic to any like ounce of discomfort. Um, even like a, a simple fast now has become a big challenge to some of us because we we have been desensitized to comfort and luxury and stuff and taking it easy and now anything that's less than that we're like ah I can't take this anymore that's why so many people when they go to other countries in the world and see how they're living and what they have to go through. They come back so happy, so grateful, and so appreciative because they say, oh my gosh, I thought I had it hard. I'm, I'm like a king. Um, <clears throat> and then we spent a good bit of time on verse 11. Remember that? Um, it was like a... I'm sorry. That verse showed us like the progress of events in the proper order that result from godly sorrow. How it begins with godly sorrow, and then godly sorrow leads to diligence. Um, and the diligence is like basically a determination uh, to clean ourselves. But then that determination that leads to us trying to clean ourselves leads to indignation, to frustration. Why? Because it's not as it's easier said than done. It's 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 not that easy to just decide it and halas. I wish, um, but no, you know, you you can decide with all your heart, and then you find out that it's very difficult, and you still keep two step forward, one step back. And um, <clears throat> I don't remember if I mentioned it or not. But if I didn't mention it last week, I'm sure y'all have heard me mention it a lot. That lovely quote by C.S. Lewis, which says that we don't know how bad we are until we try very hard to be good. And that's why people who never try to be very good think they're very good. <laughs> <laughs> and then people who are often trying to be very good often feel like they're bad. Not faint hauntedness or, or self loathing. But anyway, so it, it leads to indignation. And then the indignation leads to fear. Why? Because, like, uh oh, like I want to repent and I'm, I'm trying to repent, but I'm not. Oh my goodness. Then you get really scared. And then you go to the vehement desire. Now you start to cry out to God and say, Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, help me, the sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, strengthen me, the sinner, etc. And then that vehement desire leads to more zeal, more diligence, more efforts, and they're like it's kind of an ongoing cycle until eventually, in God's good timing, we finally there's the vindication or the victory or the acquittal, <clears throat> the absolution or the freedom. Um, then we went to the part about the joy where where um, St. Saint Paul was saying in verse 13 in, in chapter 7 that uh, we rejoice exceedingly more for the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all so it, 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 we went through five I think yes five points of why St. Paul's joy was way higher than the joy of the Corinthians because First of all, it, he, it was joyful because of the sinner of Corinth who repented because he got news about that. Then he was also, in, in addition to that, he was joyful because the Corinthians tasted the fruit of obedience, the result of obedience, and how they did something that maybe some of them were uncomfortable or doing or felt weird doing it. Now they see the value of it. So this will, will further motivate them to obey more in the future. 
And number three, he also rejoiced because the church of Corinth has been spared from, for now from destruction. Because have they not obeyed and just let this thing keep on going, keep on going, keep on going? Um, things like the church could have possibly been like dissolved or broken or split or just messed up. And number four, he was joyful because the church of Corinth received St. Titus very well and accepted him very well. So now St. Paul is like, now he's comforted and he knows that the church of Corinth is in good hands. So this way, after he departs, then that they'll be well served by St. Titus, his disciple. <clears throat> and then lastly, um, he was very joyful because he was uh, this whole thing um, really motivated his disciple, St. Titus, you know, because they received him well and listened to him and accepted him, etc. So St. Titus will remember this after the death of St. Paul, and he'll be able to apply it when he's evangelizing or starting a new church, and and this may lead to like so many more. And as a result of this like breakdown of why St. Paul was so joyful, we talked about the butterfly effect, how Never forget the power of the butterfly effect where bad choices will affect so many down the line of time. And also good choices will affect so many future generations, um, possibly affect the whole world. Don't underestimate that, the power of the butterfly effect, whether it's good or bad. And that's was pretty much what we've... Um, covered from chapter seven does anybody have any uh comments questions or anything or anything to add <clears throat> sorry i don't know what the deal is with my voice but i think it's at least legible or understandable <clears throat> all right let us jump into second corinthians chapter eight so, um, as usual, just jump in if you have any questions or comments or anything. But for now, I'll need somebody to read from verse 1 through verse 7. And I just want to say, like, I appreciate I know some of y'all are traveling out of town or out of the country. And uh, I appreciate that in your trip or vacation that you still took time to attend the Bible study. I mean, but of, it's very good. It's very easy to to lose our uh, spiritual canon or our routine when we're traveling or on vacation. So we really have to be intentional in, in planning it. Yeah, I'm guilty of that myself, big time. Huh. Verse 1 through 7. Um, Judy, would you read for us? Sure. I was Thanks just for volunteering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right. the name moreover, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God to me. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their abilities, yes, and beyond their ability, they were free willing imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love for us, See that you abound in this grace also. Grace of God the Father be with us all of him. Thank you. And, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Chapter 8 and chapter 9 in Second Corinthians um, are revolving around one main point, which is the basically the point of giving. Uh, as you all know, one of the three pillars of our faith is giving. It's not live, laugh, love. <laughs> you 
you know, the the paintings or icons or whatever. Although that's good. That's good. Live, laugh, love. Um Remember what our Lord said? He mentioned them in the gospel that we always read, the gospel of preparation, the gospel that we read on the Sunday right before the great fast. The three pillars of our faith. <clears throat> what are they? Almsgiving is one of them. Very good. Because yeah, we're gonna we just said we're gonna talk. That's about the th what are the other two? What are the first two? He said that prayers and fasting. Yes, yes, that's what we're talking about. It's what he said in in Matthew six, like in, in the Sermon on the Mount, when he said, "When you pray, pray this way," you know, and when you fast, fast this way, and when you give, give this way. He didn't say if. So these are all like. When, 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 like, we need to be doing all three. It's just like a three-legged stool that we can stand on. You ever seen a three-legged stool? It has three legs, not four. So pray, fast, and give. If you remove any one of those three legs, the stool will topple over and you'll fall. Um, so some of us may for one reason or another, focus on one of those things or two of those things, but neglect the other. So so it's just like how, how yeah, it's, it's like a three-legged stool. So if we are going to stand, we need all three of them. So something we need to yeah, be diligent to wear and aware of it. <clears throat> so when you give, not if, but when you give, you need to give, like there's like four description, Okay. First of all, you need to give to others. <laughs> so, <coughs> some people give to themselves, <laughs> but that's that's not part of it. So number one, is, it needs to be to others. Um, we're going to talk, well, we kind of talked about that last time. Like when you say, okay, I give to my children. Okay, yes, that's others, but it's really... Ours, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm giving to my children. Like, so it needs to be given to others. And as, as we said in the sermon last time, like as Jesus taught, like in the sermon on the mount, those who don't love you, those who hate you, those who wanna annihilate you, persecute you. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Like a trinity, the trinity of, uh, of the faith. Um. So first of all, give to others, all others, like distant others. Number two, give generously. Number three, give cheerfully. Because someone can give generously, but not, they're not very cheerful. <laughs> and number four, give it willingly by choice, not by force or by fear. Or Okay, so remember those four. To others, and by others, I mean not just self or not self, but like others, generously, cheerfully, and willingly by choice. Why? What is so special about giving? And more so, actually, about giving for the right reasons. What is so special about giving? You mean is... confidential or what? No, I'm saying giving is special, right? Yes, we all agree. Why? Why is it so special? Because it's one of the attributes of God. We need to be like God. And I guess oh, I need to ask it better. What does giving that way to others generously, cheerfully, by choice, to give for the right reason. What does it demonstrate? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm not sure, but I think that that way we say those stuff are not ours, are given from God, and we're sharing them for other with other people. Okay. 
So it, it, this shows that you believe that these are not ours, these are guards. We're just stewards over them. What else? It's living this way in the sign of love. Okay. In giving, we receive. In giving, we receive. How? We receive a lot of his um, blessings and maybe in different ways, not necessarily money, but uh, I mean. That's true. It, it makes the giver feel better when, when they give rather than receive. Actually. Yeah, you said that. It's better to give than to receive. Um, I think, Father, I think it's the same principles that Jesus has gave his life for us as well. Also, it was by choice. It was generously because he gave up still his life. What else? Cheerfully. Cheerfully. Yes, no, it's a, it it sure pleased sure. him. It pleased him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like he, 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 yes. But even if, if, because there was some point when, when he asked his father to take this from him, but he, he still did it anyway. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. And for the right reason. Yes, yes, <laughs> naturally. We're going to address that in a minute. And like, I like what, what uh, Mary said, like give without asking. For anything return and actually maybe something each one of us can ask themselves would i still give to others generously cheerfully by choice if i weren't like if i didn't have assurance that i'm going to receive by giving but just to give out of love to others as opposed to to give because Sooner or later, there's something in it for me. Um, somebody said, Abuna, who was uh, who somebody was going to say something? Yeah, I want to say that um, the, the, the Bible says that the one who gives to the poor lends to God, mm. and God means it, <laughs> I, I, you know. So, um, so the, the uh, the, the, you know, you get blessed in so many ways. Yes, and 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 this was the only thing that God said: try me on it. Say, give and try me. Just see what see what I do. Um, let's take on the challenge. So, the reason giving is is so special, and especially when you give for the right reasons, is because, as they say, put your money where your mouth is. Giving for the right reasons is a way of modeling or putting into practice the two greatest commandments, to love God and to love neighbor. How um, you are loving your neighbor by giving them all kinds of giving, by the way, we're not talking just about material giving. So that's, that's the second commandment. And if you are doing it for the right reasons, you are doing it out of your love for God. Right? So you cannot claim that you love God and love neighbor if you do not give to your neighbor out of your love for God. Now, you can give to your neighbor to impress other people. You can give to your neighbor to hold it over their head. You can give to your neighbor so that they'll scratch your back one day. Like So there, there are wrong reasons to give. But um, one cannot claim that they love God and love neighbor if they don't generously, cheerfully, by choice, etc., freely give to their neighbor out of their love for God. The, the right kind of giving covers the two greatest commandments. <clears throat> now, this is a nice um, exercise. If you want to know what you really believe, right? Jeremiah says that the heart is deceitful above all things. So like some people think they're like the really, really strong believers and then God tells them, I don't know you, right? So if you want to really know what you really believe, what you really value, what you really prioritize, simply look at your bank statement. After food and utilities and mortgage or rent or whatever, 
where does the rest of your money go? What is done with it? Hey, is it wrong to have fun, to go to a movie or to entertain or to save money or to invest? No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. We need to be careful because there's some stuff later that causes some confusion and some people use it for other purposes. But simply look at it and see where does my money go? <clears throat> Remember, we talked about this, uh, was it last week or the week before, how when God said, you know, when God mentioned his number one competitor, if you will, it was money. He said, you cannot worship God and money. He picked that out of anything else, authority or popularity or or fun or whatever. Um, the truly Christian person is a giving person. And giving again, it's not just mammon. It's not just financial or, or tangible giving like clothes or or a piece of furniture or you know food no but there's also giving and sometimes those are even bigger giving kindness giving a smile giving time giving energy giving truth but gently um giving sincere encouragement and hope the the tangible giving whether it's like money or food or clothes or or whatever, it's actually the easier one. Um, the other stuff, it's like I'm giving a piece of my heart. I'm investing a piece of my psyche and my mind and, and who I am, of my person. And, and it takes more energy, it takes more care, and it can take a lot more time. If I'm giving something tangible, it's like here, done, two seconds. Or if I cook the meal, well, two hours and two seconds. But the other one can be, yeah, we need to have the right scale. We need to value things in their right order. I'm not saying giving tangibly is bad. Relax, Yanni. Matthew 25, I was hungry, you fed me. I was uh, thirsty, you gave me to drink. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me, etc. So there's the, like the first um, three of those are tangible gifts. And then Sick and you visited me in prison and you came to me a stranger and you took me in. Well, that one kind of combines both the tangible and the untangible, intangible. Um, but visiting the sick or those are in prison, uh, that's a different kind. <clears throat> so, verse one. He says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Um, to give you a, a like kind of a picture or a frame of where is this. Corinth is in the south re region of Greece. Remember between the two international ports. And, um, and Macedonia is in the north part of Greece. Okay. And so St. Paul is informing the church of Corinth about how gifted the Church of Macedonia is in the gift of giving when it came to giving. Why is he telling them this? So they would like compare or be compared and like maybe feel ashamed or feel bad. No. No, to encourage them to follow their footsteps. Yes. He's telling them this because he wishes for the Church of Corinth to have this most wonderful gift because, like um, Suhair said, like it's better to give than to receive. But he wants them to taste the joy of giving and the blessings of giving and the freedom of giving. Um, think of any time you received and think of any time you gave, like from your heart for the right reasons. No question. You're a lot more joyful and a lot happier when you're the one giving. Notice that he calls he calls it something like very, very neat. He says, the grace of God bestowed. Why? Because to truly give others freely, generously, willingly, cheerfully, 
and maybe even those to those who don't love you or who want to hurt you, like we said earlier, is only a grace that is given by God. It cannot be done based on human powers or human abilities or human love only. Um, maybe I should say it cannot be done consistently based on uh, those, you know, the human stuff. This may be a better because like everybody can do it, but it wouldn't be consistent and it won't be um, always cheerful and it won't always be freely and it won't always be um, to those who, who don't love me or want to hurt me or, or whatever. By the way, St. Paul was writing the second epistle to the Corinthians while he was in Macedonia. So just keep that in mind. So he's he's in the midst of the Macedonians while he's writing this. Um, okay, what else does he want to make known to the Corinthians? Verse 2, like he said, moreover, brethren, we make known to you. So number one, the grace of God bestowed on the church of Macedonia. Number two, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. This sentence is like crazy, right? Like there's so many words that are opposite to each other. Philosophy. You see that? Huh? Philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> so he says what? In the great trial of their affliction, there's abundance of their joy. And their deep poverty abounded. Deep poverty. It abounded in the rich in the riches of their liberality. You get that? So what does this mean? He's telling the Corinthians that even though the Macedonians were actually going through some really hard times, they had great trial of affliction. Okay. And even though they were going through abundant deep poverty. In spite of the hardships and the toughness and the difficulties and the depravity, it gave them great joy to give liberally, liberally and generously and freely. So even though they themselves were in need, it gave them great joy to give generously and, and freely and liberally. Back then, there was a beautiful Jewish um, tradition. I don't know if it's still alive today or not. And that tradition started from the time of Queen Esther, at the time of the, the Empire of the Medes and the Persians. And they kept that tradition until the time of St. Paul. Um, as you know, up until this point, when people would refer to something, they would say like, you know, like, you know, God who, who like brought us out of Egypt with the mighty hand and ostrich arm and stuff like that. It was like the biggest celebration they could, any, of course, any, any Jew can celebrate. But then from that point in time, at the time of Queen Esther, they would say like how, uh, uh, for, you know, the God who, who saved them from annihilation. If, if you don't recall the story, um, go back and read the book of Esther. It's not, not the time for it right now. <clears throat> so um, they kept it up until the time of St. Paul, which is basically that after the Jews were miraculously saved by God through Queen Esther, that they started celebrating a very important feast. You know the name of the feast? It's called the Feast of Purim. The Feast of Purim. And that beautiful tradition is that is basically this that every single Jewish person must give something, no matter how small or how insignificant to someone else, poorer than them. Every single one must give to somebody who's who's less fortunate than them or who has less than them in order to be reminded of their much needed solidarity to stick together and to be reminded that they 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 need each other 
and to be reminded of their need to try their best to always be in one accord. <clears throat> like we're saying in the sermon last Sunday, how this is like crucially important. And the people of Macedonia were actually still living that. They don't know the term, please listen to this. They don't know the term, I can't give. Or I don't have anything to give. Those words should never come out of our mouth. There's always something we can give. And again, don't get hung up on the tangible. There's always something we can give. Which is why even the... Th even though they were going through some very tough times and some trials and deep poverty, not giving something, not giving something, anything, no matter how small, was not an option. Because no matter how poor or lacking I am, there's someone out there who is poorer than I or lacks even more than I. No matter how bad I have it, someone else has it worse. Right, we say in Egypt, right? He who sees the misery of others forgets his own pain or his own misery. So, and, and whether the gift is something material or tangible or something symbolic or emotional or spiritual or intellectual. So, bottom line is not giving is not an option. And he put that somewhere and frame it in your house. Of not giving something is not an option. And not only did these Macedonians like give what they could, but even more than what they could. Look at verse 3. <clears throat> For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Um. One time there was a guy, and he philosophizing, speaking of philosophy, who, who, who was wondering, who do you think is more giving, rich people or poor people? Poor people. Why? Are you waiting for an answer? I am like because you know when they when when you do the math, there's something called the Pareto principle, which says something like twenty percent of the people give eighty percent of the, you know. So so, you say poor people with confidence. So, how? Why? Because because rich people they they can give, they can give from their money, but it's always an extra. But poor people they give from their needs, so they need it more. So it's, it's it's like I don't know with the with the equation, mm. it's still it's still more than the rich people compared compared to what their needs are. Are you right? guess, for me? Um, but actually, some rich people give from like their needs as well. Like they they give till it hurts, as they say. Um, but you're right, Magdi. You were gonna say something. No, I was going to say the same, Abuna, like they give from their need. Okay. And someone said in the chat, they don't worship money. Um, Can you uh, say the question again? Sorry, I missed the question. Yes, the, the, the question we were pondering is, uh, who do you think is more giving, rich people or poor people? And why? Definitely, I would say poor too, because I think when you're rich, you might grow accustomed to having so much money and then you kind of like can become obsessed with getting so much money. And then your the percentage that you give kind of ends up being small because you end up like living for money. Okay, I'll remember those terms, okay, because this is going to come in very handy later on. Uh... Does it have to be directly related to financial like no. status or economic status. So I don't necessarily think rich or poor who has the giving more is correlated to each category. I, I feel like it depends on, I feel like it's completely correlated to um, either their trust or their stance in God or their relationship with God. I don't think, in, I don't think you can say one group of people are more giving than the other. I know a lot of really, really rich people that are wow 
and I know a lot of very, very um, financially poor people, I guess you can say, or economically poor, that, like, wow, you know? So I, I don't necessarily think one is more giving than the other. I do understand the whole giving from needs and, and whatnot, and I think maybe it's, it's maybe slightly more powerful, but I feel like it, it maybe is related to um, your 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 relationship with God and who you see, like who he is. Okay, very I'm good. Sorry, I'm going for a walk. I don't know if it's... No, no, you're good. So I would say, say I'm gonna... uh, Okay, uh, mom and then Michael. I want to say about the lady who paid, who paid two months only. I know. Christ uh, praised her. Yes, exactly. Michael? Yeah, I was going to say that whether you're rich or poor, it depends on who you see as your source of, of everything you have. Maybe that's what we were alluding to. I know where my source of supply is. If I'm poor, I know where my supply comes from. If I'm rich and I'm and I'm godly, I know where, I know who provided that for me. So I'm not willing to let I'm willing to let it go because I know I can. If he wants me to have more, he'll give me more. I'm so tickled by everything I heard, and I hope those mm-hmm. words don't come back and bite us. <laughs> um, may, I, may I add something? Here? Uh, please go ahead. I think uh, poor people, they want some need and they suffered. So that makes more sense if there was a suffering of uh, other people. Rich people, probably, they never suffer or they never were in need. And this may be why they are not sensitive to needs of uh, other people. Okay. So, f- first of all, we need to differentiate there's something or clarify something. Actually, George mentioned it. Okay that a person can be rich or poor financially and can be rich or poor in many other things. Um, A person can be rich or poor in like optimism, right? Uh, A person can be rich or poor in... uh, Empathy. In empathy. A person can be rich or poor in compassion. A person can be rich or poor in um, all kinds of things, in intelligence. A person can be rich or poor in anything, okay, tangible, not tangible, whatever. So I remember once hearing a, a lovely quote that said, like, I know people who are so poor. I mean, they're so, 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 so poor that the only thing they have is money. I know people who are so poor that the only thing they have is money. And how poor are they? Like, also, I want to encourage you, like, you know, in the in the liturgy, when we pray for the sake of the poor of your people, the widow, the orphan, the traveler, the stranger, don't think literally. I mean, yes, literally. But... A woman can be a widow while her husband is still alive and living with her in the house, right? Um, A person can be a stranger in their own home or in their own church. A person can be an orphan even though both their parents are are alive. You get what I'm saying? So... um, we need to have the, like the right mentality. So that's the first thing I wanted to talk about. Um, in the relation built again, the most. Yes, uh, yes. Just like like Maximus said, like it, it it is those who are poor, and we're not saying poor financially, but those who who are poor in any way. Why? Because they are well acquainted with being in need. They they. They tend to be more compassionate and more giving. If you go get on YouTube and look, there's tons of videos where people in suits or people dressed fine go to a homeless person and ask him, "Hey, can you spare a dollar? Can you give me something?" Or like the, right away, the like <laughs> the homeless person, like this might be all that they have in their pocket. Look here, go like, um, 
because nobody will be more compassionate than the one who tasted this poverty yes. the the this poverty in in friendship this poverty in health this poverty in uh, in companionship this poverty in anything um and that's another reason why don't look at everything painful or uncomfortable as bad because think about this if this is going to grow a tree of compassion and empathy in your heart how awesome is that i mean to make you really a loving kind compassionate person it's just amazing um so and also regarding this verse whatever it's like i bear witness according to their ability and beyond their ability they were freely willing and when we talked about uh, uh that question who is more giving, not who gives more? Who is more giving is different from who gives more. So please note that giving more is very different from being more giving. Giving more is very different from being more given. One has to do with with what or the, the amount or the whatever, and the other one has to do with the state of heart. And also, Buna, uh, verse 3, uh, they were freely willing. Mm -hmm. And nobody yani, forced yes. them to give. Yes. Now, um, can you tell me if you agree with this? And if you do, how are they different? That statement, kind of give it away, I guess. Um, giving more is very different from being more giving. I'm just not going to, Yanni, we talked about it. So, and not only were they giving beyond their ability, no, they were actually begging St. Paul to accept it and to take it to the poor and the needy in Jerusalem. This is verse four. Look at this. Look at the word choices. Imploring us with, with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. <laughs> this is like the total opposite of giving begrudgingly. Look, there's a scale of the heart of giving. Remember when they said there's a difference between giving more and being more given? So there's a scale in the heart of giving. First, the bottom is not giving. Okay, then it it's it goes up to giving, but begrudgingly. Okay, like without a cheerful heart, and then it goes up to giving, but out of obligation, or giving neutrally, not begrudgingly, but also not cheerfully. And then it goes up to giving cheerfully. Okay, that's a higher scale, higher level. And then to to like these Macedonians, to giving in, incessantly, imploringly with urgency like the Macedonians. It's almost like, I don't know if you've ever seen, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to watch. But if you've ever seen like, uh, what do they call it? A humanitarian aid to a country that's under siege or in war or, or, or have a famine, where right? when they come with a truck with something, rice or flour or oil or pillows or blankets or whatever, you see the people hovering and kind of like kind of pushing and sticking their hand out, you know, like trying to get something, even if before they know what's in there, just give me something, right? Now imagine people pushing and shoving and, and doing all this, but to give. La... I wish, I wish we're all at this state. And again, it's not giving material giving. It's all kinds, including the material giving, but giving energy, giving advice, giving a hope, giving courage, giving love, giving a smile, giving like of anything, pushing and shoving to give. And here, St. Paul gives us a beautiful new name or a new title to giving. What does he call it? He calls it the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. 
It's not just giving. It's a gift and fellowship of the ministering to the saints. When we minister to the saints, materially or intangibly, it's a gift to them and to us, and it's a fellowship and oneness. Sharikat al khidma allati lil qaddisin. Sorry, al ni'ma wa sharikat al khidma allati lil qaddisin. The gift and the fellowship of the minister to the saints. Verse 5. Verse 5 is extremely important. <clears throat> I mean, every verse is extremely important, but like it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord, then to us by the will of God. Why is this verse very important? I want to hear from you. I think uh, when the person gives the mm -hmm. self to God, giving anything else, money or no money, is it, nothing compared to giving the self. So... Mm -hmm. Besides giving the self, money is part of the self. Money and everything I have is part of me. If I give myself to the Lord, then I realize that everything I have is the Lord's. Yes. That was says, love God first, then neighbor. Yes. Okay. Again, speaking of having the right mindset and the right scale and the right priorities and, and clarity. You might laugh at me when I say after everything we've said. The actual act of giving is not the main important thing. After everything we said, <laughs> the actual act of giving is not the main most important thing, but rather the main most important thing is that the person first gives themselves to God and then to give of the rest that they may have to others. Meaning they must first be living for God. They they must be they must first like Yani to live according to the will of God. Yani, to give a lot and to live according to my will instead of God's will will never suffice or substitute my living according to God's will first. Can I say that again? To give a lot and along with that to live according to my will instead of to God's will will never suffice or substitute my living according to God's will first. Why am I saying this? <clears throat> I'll give you the, the extreme case, okay? An extreme case of this would be like kind of like some some mafia gangsters, right? Some of them, the mafia guys who are at the same time very generous. Now you may say like, you know, have you heard about those? There's like some mafia people, whatever, with all kinds of whatever, but they might see a, you know, a person who's... Uh, poor or whatever and they like just get them all kinds of stuff and you go oh <laughs> no um, now you may tell yourself I would never do a crime and try to make up for it by giving more and being more generous okay I believe you but for as much as we talked about how important giving is as the third leg of that three-legged stool that we stand on, please don't ever think that you can make up or atone for your living according to your own will by some extra giving. And I know some people who, instead of confessing, they like, go and give more to the church or to the poor or to whatever. It's almost like it's um, 
because there's something in their heart that's tugging at their hearts like they, they feel like it's not right and they have some guilt or shame or or you know conviction by the Holy Spirit and but instead of going to confess they go and like give Abuna yes uh, if I go if I give myself to God and I am united with him there this will change the person pretty much he will be compassionate he will be any giving a, yeah he will change since yes. they gave themselves to God first they changed completely yes so one will cover did. the others one will cover yeah. the other like so if if I give myself truly give myself to God naturally I will be a more giving person to other people and again not material given necessarily but just more attentive more compassionate more empathetic like y'all said so we need to have the right scale, the right values. Uh, go ahead, George. Um, can you correlate or can you can you connect? Um, you said like you can never atone and whatnot. Um, how how would you explain? I'm not saying that they were using it for atonement, but how would you explain prostrations in the church, or whenever a church father will give their child? Their, their spiritual child um, prostrations due to some sort of um, sin they're falling into or some sort of action they did or something like that. Because you said you cannot give to cover up, you know, anything you're doing um, or whatnot. So how does it work with, uh, like, church fathers giving prostrations? Can I, can uh, I take a shot at that? Sure, go ahead. It reminds me of Psalm 51, where the Lord doesn't desire sacrifices, or doesn't desire offerings and burnt offerings. He desires a broken and a contrite heart. And perhaps the prostrations are an avenue to having a broken and contrite heart. And and if I may, yes, and if I may add to that, um. And I hope this does not sound too harsh. But so the elder uh, father or monk or whatever you said, George, in your question, by prostrating to uh, his or her um, like disciple or, or son or spiritual child or whatever, it's wonderful, right? But did it atone? Wait, what? Are you, what are you, I'm not saying that. No, no, no. I'm not saying that. I'm saying... Like in their spirit, like somebody falls into this thing and then the father gives their kid like, hey, go prostrate 450 times in your room, like in your, or in your cell, like not, not like in front of. Oh, the, oh, oh, like when a father of confession whatever. gives a, a canon or a rule to their, the person who confesses with them, yes. like uh, a, a certain but Mike uh, discipline. Mike explained it well. Okay. I think it just leads to, uh, yeah. Uh, th that first of all, okay, it's already been atoned for. How do we know that? Because the father confession told them that. How do we know that? Because they confessed it already. But there are other purposes for this stuff. Is that because we're human? Sometimes, it, like going through the pain or the uh, suffering or the discomfort of some consequence, it helps. Uh, stick in our mind a little bit more. It helps stick in our memory a little bit more. Um, like a person, maybe, I don't know, maybe their father confession will tell them, like you said, go do 400 or 500 matanias. And after they've done 60 or 70, they're like, oh my gosh, I can't. But they like, for faithfulness, they like push themselves, push themselves, push themselves until maybe they cry or maybe they sit and like they go, wow. Like, and uh, and what I've done is, is not even... Um, as much as painful as the pain that I caused to the heart, to my brother, to my sister. So it, it helps them, you know, um, it's for their benefit, like for their, um, it's, it's not for atonement. It's for their benefit. The spiritual exercise or canon or discipline, if you want to call that, that the father confession uh, ordains is, is for the benefit for discipling, etc. It's not for the atonement. 
the atonement is simply by the the person's sincere heart. I think, um, yeah, Michael mentioned that the sincerity of heart. It's not just a, a transaction. I go, I did one, two, three, four, five. Uh, I've sinned, forgive me, and then you pray over them, and we're the sincere, contrite heart repentance. Um, and the rest is more for discipline and benefit. <clears throat> Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, question. Um, oh, yeah, we're at verse, verse 6. So as we said, please don't ever think that you can make up for living according to your will by simply by just some extra giving. <clears throat> Verse six. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. Um, St. Paul assigned St. Titus to go to the churches to collect what he can to give to the church in Jerusalem, which was extremely poor and extremely persecuted and, and destitute at that time. Which is actually, I think it's neatly ironic, right? Because St. Paul is working so hard to collect for the city that he was working so hard on ridding of all Christians. Um and thank God, Yanni, yeah, God stopped him. Like he wasn't successful in eradicating all the Christians. Um, verse seven. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, you see that, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Yanni, yeah, so I love the balance of Christianity, Yanni. Yeah, He's also saying, like, okay, to, to give encouraging words, to to tub tub, to um say a prayer for somebody, to um, you know, give some knowledge or talk with somebody or give them some of your time. These are all wonderful. Okay. But again, they're not gonna be a substitute for the third leg of of uh, giving. I'm sorry, it is the third leg, but it's not gonna substitute for the tangible part of the giving given materially as well. I don't want to keep saying you can give from energy, give from your time, give from your encouragement, give from whatever. Uh, yes, that's all true, but don't let that trump the, the actual tangible, physical, financial giving or clothes or food or, or whatever. Um, and actually in verse 7, St. Paul is complimenting the Corinthians again and strongly encouraging them and building them up. Remember we talked last time or the week before about how that you can rebuke somebody while still encouraging them. So he's doing that. He, he's saying like, y'all grew and increased in faith and in speech and in knowledge and in all diligence and in love. So yalla, how about y'all grow also in this? How about you also grow in the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Bottom line is that if we're not done breathing, we're not done growing, no matter how much we've grown already, and we're not done giving. If we're not done breathing, we're not, not we're not done growing, and we're not done giving. Um good, we still have time. The common part is really cool. So, uh, questions, comments, or anything? Yes, Abuna. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's a bit triggering to me, specifically like like the part of giving generously. I like what would be the boundary because there is like I I don't I don't know exactly how it how it would be in English, but there is like the other verse which is like, um, mm -hmm. So it's like that balance because I, I guess you can, I know some people who like could give like to the end because they thought this is how like Jesus gave to the, gave 
give to the end as well. So they like mm-hmm. do it as like, okay, as, as Jesus did it, but like people easily abuse of that. Mm-hmm. Any kind of giving, materialistically or non-materialistically. So still we are living in a world, I don't know. And in the same time, would it be like, okay, so I don't know, like follow the part of like, um, I don't know, the part of like, okay, I will I will follow the saint, the saint's life and I will give and I don't want anything. And if you want to abuse of me, abuse of me. But in the same time, that's not really wise. I, like, I don't know, what would be the boundary? Mm. In sometimes, that, in a uh, Christian way. sometimes people like really struggle with that verse that says, to everyone who asks you, give. Mm-hmm. To everyone who asks you, like, huh? <laughs> um, and I'm so happy you asked this question because St. Paul so brilliantly, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, knew that you were going to ask this question. And so he addressed it in the next few verses. In verse um, 13, 14. Um, so hold, just hold on for a few minutes and we'll, um, if possible. Yeah, but who determines if it's possible? Um, let's read verse 8 through 15 and we'll, we'll jump into that. So just give me a few minutes and hopefully we'll, we'll address it before we run out of time. Hey, who will read 8 to 15? 8 through 15. Okay, I I'll read. Okay, Mary said, I mean, uh, Michael said it first. Michael can go ahead. <laughs> yes. Go ahead, Mary. Michael said, in the name no, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, okay. I mean. I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And in this, I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Grace of God the Father be with us all, amen. Thank you. Hey, does that answer your question? Hi. Right. We'll break it down. Go deeper back into So verse 8, he said, I speak not by commandment. It's funny how many church members are calling or texting me during the Bible study. So it tells you they don't like look at the announcements. or <laughs> Where is he? Why isn't he answering? Um, did I just say that in the video? Yalla. Verse 8, it says, I speak not by commandment. He wants to make it clear that they understand that he's not ordering them by his apostleship to do this. Why? Lest they think, because this might support what, remember others were like making all kinds of claims and sp- spreading rumors about him. So lest they think that St. Paul has been doing all that he's been doing for the goal of collecting money from them. So said, I'm, I'm not, this is not by commandment. I'm not commanding you to do this, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of other Allah. How is he going to test the sincerity of their love by the diligence of other? He's saying, rather, I am showing how others, for example, the, the Macedonians, <clears throat> I'm showing you how the Macedonians demonstrated the sincerity of the love and put their money where their mouth is. So I want to see how sincere your love is too. Like I'm excited to see what you're going to do. It's almost like, like a father sees a child who's, um, I don't know, crying because they don't have cookies. 
And then, so the father tells his child, look, uh, Johnny over there, he's crying because he doesn't have cookies. And, and his child is holding a bag of cookies. So why is he telling them this? Not to guilt the son, but to, he wants, he wants to give, like, bring into their attention and, and to give his son or his daughter a chance to share, to, to step up. He wants to, to see that joy. Wow, my child cares. My child knows his others. My child is not, you know, narcissistic, whatever. And then St. Paul gives them another example of giving, which is the best and most wonderful, most beautiful giving that is demonstrated by the most sincere love, which is the giving of whom? Sahla, Sunday school answer. Christ. The giving himself. of our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 9. He goes, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. So, not only did our Lord Jesus Christ give generously and give cheerfully and give with sincere love and give freely and liberally, but he wants to give you... Uh, he wanted to give you so much where he wants to give you so much that he made himself poor he made himself poor this reminds me of Philippians 2 verse 6 to 8 which says who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal to God to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a slave and coming in the likeness of men, God reducing himself to men, to the level of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He made himself poor that you might become rich. And not only that, for your sakes, he became poor that through his poverty, that you through his poverty might become rich. <clears throat> As we say in the praises and, and we say often, he took what is ours, what? To give us what is his. First, let that soak in for a minute. Then, after all he's done for you. Like for me, for me, the miracle, the miracle of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ is bigger than the miracle of his resurrection. He's life, you know, like, but the fact that anyway, it's not the time for this. Um, so let that soak in for a minute. Then, after all he's done for you, if he asks you to love others, to give all types of giving, how much are you willing to do to show him that you really appreciate and honor him as and his priceless gift to you? It's it's so easy to say, I love you, God. Amin, amin, amin. We praise you. We bless you. But this is how we show how much we appreciate and know as much as our brain can know the magnitude of his gift for us. We're going to read verse 10 and 11 together. It says, A, and in this I give advice. It is to your advantage, uh, like Sohir said earlier, it is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete, keyword, you also must complete the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion of what you have. <clears throat> So, 
after the Macedonians, the example of, of the Macedonians, and then the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, St. Paul has given the Corinthians a third example of that kind of good giving. Who is it? Who is the third example of, of good giving in verse 10 and 11? It's actually the Corinthians themselves. Look at this. Remember, again, as he's rebuking and as he's teaching, he's always encouraging and motivating. He's telling them a year ago, when y'all were younger, newer Christians, y'all had a strong desire to give. Now that you are a bit more mature as Christians, I don't want you to digress to a, a level below last year. I want y'all to keep heading in that trajectory. Do, do you get what he's saying? So like last year, y'all were desiring and stuff like that. Now better that you've you've spent a year with God, you've hopefully grown and stuff, Yanni. Get it done. Yanni, keep at it. And 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 then there's like a very, very important fact here, which is very obvious, but very important. Desire is great. Desire to do good is great. Beginning is awesome. Yanni, desire is at the level of the mind and the heart. Beginning is awesome. Now it's like we're putting it into action. But those two alone are not enough. We must also aspire to what? Right? To complete. Um, many of us desire and begin and then take a couple of steps and then go on to the next thing. Flash in the pan kind of a thing <clears throat> to complete, which requires endurance, which requires a persistence, perseverance, and, and longevity, and continuity, reliability. And what will motivate all this stuff is that sincere appreciation of God who emptied himself, who, who made himself poor for our sake. Verse 12. We've got to hurry a little bit. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what one, to what he does not have. Now he's beginning to address what Norma was asking about. Um, but before we get to that, I have a, 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 a question for you. I'm going to give you two scenarios. And, and some of you, I may have said this, confession or something. So if you know the answer, don't, don't be too quick to jump in. Say a young monk or a nun in their like 20s or 30s, does like a hundred prostrations a day. And it's like no big deal to them. Like it's it's not a huge challenge to them. Okay. And then an older, less flexible, more ailed person who wants to do one prostration and they really push themselves to do it. And and they can't like all they're capable of doing is like pushing themselves to bend their their neck a little bit just like you know, a little bit. And then just, it's excruciatingly painful. So they stop and they straighten themselves back out. And they're trying to do this while they're sitting down. Which one of those do you think prostrated more? I'm asking. I haven't heard this before. No, but... What George? I think I think that I haven't heard this before, so I don't know what the answer is. Um, I, I would say it's actually equal. Because still fulfilling the command, because especially for monastics, like they'll tell you firsthand that the feelings go away. You know, so the person mm -hmm. that you know try like so. I think that even obeying the command is equal to the person that really, really tries. And I think that that goes even into the right hand of the thief even. He kind of, to me, kind of gives the example of the one who kind of just tried. You know, he just threw himself out there to just try. Mm -hmm. Versus someone like maybe St. Paul, 
not St. Paul because he yeah, probably had a really good time doing it, but somebody else that just obeyed and just even though they didn't want to do it, maybe. Um, so honestly, I feel like it's it, they're both equal. So I agree with you in the in the fact that they they both gave and they are both um, delightful to God. Uh, but one of them is more precious. Actually, I think Mom mentioned the example a little yeah, bit earlier. The old, the old Yabuna. The old, uh, the uh, old uh, yes. person. I'm talking about the example when you mentioned the widow that gave the two mites. Um, yeah. um, it's so like I can imagine. I'm not gonna put my myself in God's place, but I can imagine God like could have seen this person. Start saying, eh, whatever, but I'm old, I'm hurt, you know, I'm not gonna. It's not, they're like really trying. They want to offer something to God. They want to express their their worship to God like the, somehow. Can you think of other examples to support this statement? That what matters is not what we do, but rather what we do relative to what we are capable of doing. What matters is not what we do, but rather what we do relative to what we are capable of doing. I'll give you an example. Go ahead. If it was my, let's say my birthday, and I got gifts from my family that were very just sweet and loving, and then my, let's say my niece, who's, you know, you know a few years old, she makes a drawing for me. It has no monetary value, but it just touches my heart in a way that the others don't. Not that I, I love less of the others. It was this giving, but there's something very touching. Hmm. I imagine like a little child, I think a lot of us experience this, like they sit there for maybe hours, you know, sticking buttons and stickers and like putting some glitter and like making a mess of things and like really working on it for hours. To them, that's like you know, the equivalent of an adult working, I don't know, a whole month or something <laughs> to, to get you a gift. Yeah, that's a good one. I give an example of Amber Bishoy was very old and he carried Jesus and he did he thought he's a poor old man, carried him on his shoulder for a long distance. Hmm. Yes. Any others? Can I ask a question? Please. Can you please explain the, or um, talk a little bit about the balance? Because you're saying, you're comparing somebody doing something. I think if I remembered your, your statement, it was like somebody... Uh, doing something versus something, somebody doing something relative to what they can do. Yeah. And I feel like you, unless I'm misunderstanding, can you please talk about the balance between doing something you can do and then still like just doing, like knowing you can do something, but still doing like, like, is, are, are, like, is this just without guidance at all? Because like for me, let's say, not for me, but let's say for somebody else, let's say they can fast five days a week and they know they can fast five days a week. But the confession father says, okay, only fast two days a week. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Even though they know they can fast five, mm -hmm. they're, they're just doing two. So I don't, I don't, are you referring to just somebody just seeing something good and then choosing to do it or not? Or are you just referring right. to, because you're, you're comparing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and for example, I, I, God made it very clear when he said, I, I'd rather obedience more than sacrifice. So the person was father confession told them, no, don't fast all five days, fast two days. Obedience is better. Now, the person can, you know, say the father confession tell them, can you fast two days in a row? And he said, like, oh, he tells them, okay, fast two days. But he said, Abuna, yani, honestly, yani, I've, I've done it before where I could fast five days. And he said, uh, then Abuna can either say, oh, okay, then you can do this, or Abuna can say, let do two days. So that's that's more important to obey. But I'm talking about okay, say, uh, and, and again, please hear me because I don't want to minimize stuff. 
say, um, uh, uh, a single person who has, you know, eight to five job and uh, they're young and healthy and capable and they have a good working car and all that stuff. And they like serve, say, Sunday school. Okay. They give, they give lessons, they prepare, they call the kids, they do visitations, they take them on outings and, and trips and all that stuff. Wonderful, lovely. And they're doing it joyfully and they're doing it happily. Awesome. We're not taking anything away from that. But in comparison with a person who is um, not as free, like they have more responsibilities, maybe they're married, they have kids and they and their job is more demanding and they have like, you know, stuff to do at home, cooking, laundry, cleaning, mowing the grass, whatever, and, and you know, all that stuff. And they also uh, prepare and give lessons and call and do visitations and do outings and stuff like that. Are both delightful to God? Absolutely. Is the gift acceptable with joy from, from God? Absolutely. But one is sweeter. Like Jesus said, one gave more. Even though they did the same amount of work, the same amount of time, the same amount of dedication, one gave more. Why? Because it's relative to what they're capable of giving. Um, okay. Now we get to, oh, we're out of time. Complete no, Norma, can, can you wait to, to get the answer to your question next week? <laughs> Because it's it's verse thirteen, so it's, it's the one we're gonna we're about to get into. But it's Yani. It's it's kind of a big section, so I don't want to be east. Yani, uh, cut it short. Uh, sorry, uh, says Ramses. Go ahead. I didn't hear you. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, no. Oh, you weren't saying anything. Uh, that's right. I. Oh, uh... okay. I'm muted by mistake, sorry. Oh, okay, no problem. Um quite see you didn't do that like that lady that says, Yeah, George Jai Salsa al Macarona. <laughs> that was funny. Um all right, so let's stop here. There's so much more. It's just amazing. Taib, before we part ways, does anybody um have any questions or comments or something they'd like to share or something maybe they're gonna try to focus on? anything <laughs> i i have a question maybe i don't know if i feel super comfortable leaving this talking about i know that's not your point or anything but i don't know how comfortable i feel leaving this comparing somebody's you know you just said like both are good in the eyes of god both, both are accepted with grace in the eyes of god both are delightful to god then to me it's like why are we comparing i know that you're not saying this but 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 also like I just, I just don't know. Like, I feel like I feel bad for maybe people that, you know, that one is still lesser than the other. Cause you know, like 30, 60 and a hundred, they're all even. Yes. Someone gave they're, more. They're but... all good. Man, yeah. So it that's says why that God rewards I... everyone according to their deeds. Uh, Like the okay. one who, the one who, who, was entrusted over five and traded and worked with them. He became entrusted over ten, and the one who did the same thing and 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 got the same one hundred percent results. He was entrusted with four. Um, but as we say often in heaven, there are ranks, right? Different glories, different crowns. How? Or. As the story of, uh, I believe it was St. Macarius the Great, who was thanking God for like uh, making himself known to St. Macarius and like kind of his word and the loveliness and all that stuff. And, and then God told him, you want to see somebody higher than you? He said, yes, please. Yes, please. No, it wasn't like he wants to like learn and stuff. And he sent him to to what? The two women who were married to two brothers and took care of their husbands and their kids and like helped each other and stuff like that. So there is a, there is a, are they all good soils? Yes, but there is a uh, ranks, okay? And like, like, you know, King David said, like, I'd rather just be on the, do on the doorstep 
on the door uh, on the threshold of, of the gate of heaven than to be living in the fancy tents of Qadar. Um, so I can present it to you in, in a in maybe in a positive way. So I talk with people a lot who feel like they're bad Christians or like they're not sincere Christians. Lee Habibi, what's going on? Because I, I I can't stand up. I don't stand up in the liturgy. Ya yeah, Habibi, it's, it's not about that. Yani, you could be sitting down physically, but in your heart, you're standing up like a soldier. And someone else could be standing up like a soldier, but in their heart, they're like in another country. You know what I'm saying? So don't think, that, or, or another, I'll give you another example. Uh, and I learned Where this was this when I was younger? <laughs> It's 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 what you can do relative to what you can do. Look, now you stand the whole liturgy, no problem, right? Actually, no, not all of it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'll share with y'all something really neat I learned from His Grace Bishop Gregory when he was visiting us a couple of weeks ago. We were visiting a home, and uh, a woman uh, who is uh, a single mom and has her two elderly parents living with her and they're both sick <laughs> and she's working full time taking care of all four of them herself the child and the and the two grandparents and she was telling <laughs> and the gregory with a sincere heart saying that like i i'm like i'm sad like you know like when i was younger i used to pray more i used to read the bible more like i was so uh, zealous and active and like and she was feeling like she was just a, a bad Christian like or insincere Christian or whatever and then by Gregory I uh, loved what he said like it's that okay yeah back then it, like quantity wise I don't remember what he said word for word but but you get what I'm saying like what you did quantity wise maybe was more but what you're doing right now even though quantity wise is less in God's eyes it may be way more why? Because like you have so much on your shoulders, so much exhaustion, responsibilities, and and all kinds of stuff. But that that little thing, yani, is what yani, percentage wise, relative wise, it's it's way more. You, you get what I'm saying? Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. But again. Like you said, they're all good soils. They're all delightful. They're all sweet. And God, the Father, loves anything that his children offer to him. Because no matter how awesome what we offer him is what? It's like filthy rags, like the Bible says. <laughs> it's like the scribbles with the crayon on a sheet of paper. You know, somebody might build a monastery for God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Some some people did. And like, but... To God, what is it? It's just like the scribbles on a, on a, on a piece of shit. What, what is worthy of like God or, or, or whatever? It's just, it's the state of the heart. And it's, this is a key word, is that what I'm doing relative to what I'm capable of doing. Um, I was in a funeral a couple of months ago. I may have mentioned this already, but it's just really touched me. Uh, just a, a very noble, like just lovely, lovely man. And um, uh, like he would serve in the church, even though he was like getting older and older, like I think into his 80s or late 80s. And, and he got to a point to where his health and his age and stuff were not allowing him to even leave out of the house. I wouldn't would have to go every once in a while, once a month, or once every few weeks and give him communion and stuff. And he was kind of like those Macedonians, Abuna, please, I want to serve, please. Give me, give me something. I want to like do something for God, for the glory of God, for my brothers and sisters. From like, and Abu like, I don't know what to tell the guy. Like, how is he? He's, gonna, he's like bedridden. What are you, what are you gonna do? And he told them, uh, you can support them by your prayers. And of course, the prayer is is is. I'm not saying this kid, Ayani. It's it's really like I've mentioned this before. That prayer meeting that the the a few people get together and do weekly is the most important service in the whole church because it supports all the other services. And, but the, um, so the man told Abuna, like, I want to do more. I want to do more. It's like, 
he has nothing, but he's really pushing and insisting and like, I want to give more and not like whining, but he was like so passionate about it, as much passion that he could have with his state and energy. And then Abuna like couldn't think of anything. So he told Abuna what he was going to do. He told him, Abuna, would you be okay if I write letters of like encouragement, letters of uh, hope, letters of comfort to people in the church that I know they're like lonely or aging or dying or uh, struggling of different kinds of struggle whatever, but I won't put, and I'll just mail it to them, but I won't put the return address. And Abuna said, like he was relieved. They said, oh, yes, that's great. Do that. <laughs> And see how like a person who really wants to, they'll figure out something. They'll get so creative, they'll figure out something. And for the rest of this man's life, people will come to church and go, Abuna, did you send me this letter? He's like, no, Habibi, I didn't. Who sent me this letter? He's like, oh, like God. <laughs> you know, Abuna can't say, of course, because he asked Abuna not to say. But of course, until after the the, the he departed, then Abuna was saying this. So... It's it's this person was giving more than I was giving as a full time priest. Just by by getting these letters in God's eyes, I, to me, I think, yeah, I mean, you know, I tell you, like if I were in his place, maybe I would say, Khalas, but, yeah, I mean, I've I've uh, finished the race, I fought the good fight, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I did my part, but slap, like just dying to give. Sorry, I went way over. Um, Abun, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know we talked about, uh, or we talked earlier about um, making sure that we give for the right reasons. Mm. How does a person avoid falling in the trap of giving? in order to receive praise is giving privately or in secrecy the only way uh no because you're not going to always be able to give in privacy or, or you're not going to always be able to give in secrecy because what if what you're giving is not something physical or tangible that you can just put on somebody's door or put in their purse or or whatever what if it's encouragement or hope or a verse or a hug or a smile? They will see that you're the one who gave them, right? Even if you do it one-on-one. -on -one. So the way to do that is is a lot of self-reflection and a lot of like, um, like examining our motives. I love and I appreciate our, our wise mother, the church, in the conclusion of every hour in the Egbeya, we pray, Purify our intentions. Remember that? Naqi uh, niyatna. Uh, is that is that the one in Arabic? So uh, the simple fact that a person asked this, and and it's always good for me to ask myself, why why did I do this? Why do I want to do this? Why did this make me feel this way? Whether I did something bad or good. Because it's not the, the actual deed; it's it's more so the what's the heart behind it. Thank I you, Abuna. The simple fact, Diani, that you asked that question shows that you you really want to do it for the right reasons, which is a good sign. <laughs> not that you're immune, and none of us are, and 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 that's another thing. Sometimes we will give for the right reasons, and sometimes we will give for the wrong reasons. We're not going to always give for the right reasons. Just remember this, okay? Because like Christianity in one word is love. Like that song says, the Bible in a word is love, and God is love. And love is give. For God so loved the world that he gave. You want to test how sincere your love is, see how much you give. This comes in very handy, like also in parenting or like in marriage, how how sometimes children feel like they're not loved and like their mom or dad, like, I'm working so hard for you and I'm buying you all kinds of new stuff or all kinds of games and, and things. It's like, but 
I I need love does what the person needs, not what the person wants. Look, I I need you. I need your presence. I need your heart. My son, give me your heart. I need to stop. <laughs> Otherwise, Um All right. Thank you all very much. And uh, we'll, we'll resume, God willing, next week with a uh, normal question uh, about the, the, the kind of the, I guess, boundaries or balance in giving. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Holy Father God, we love you. Help us love you. We believe, help our unbelief. We love you. Help our lack of love. Um, Lord, thank you for being the role model and practicing everything before you preached it. Um, help us a lot to get it. Help us to be like you and to um, demonstrate the sincerity of our love and our faith to ourselves and to others um, by being givers and by being givers consistently and giving when it hurts and giving diligently and for the long term and doing it with a cheerful and freely uh, and, and willing heart. We ask you to please hear us through the intercession of men and all saints of martyrs. So please, you from the beginning and the matter power of life coming across. Please, O oh Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the love of God, the Father, grace is only begotten Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the communion, the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. Thank yes. you all so much. Sorry I kept you all longer today. Thanks, Abona. See you next Wednesday. Bye, Habib. Bye.